Welcome, good evening everyone, or good morning, depending where you are, and welcome to another round of Explorers Month in ICE Intercultural Education. We are an organization that loves to learn more about the world, and we want to help you learn more as well. My name is Till, I'm one of the regulars from ICE, but I'm very honored to have two guests with us here who are going to guide us through this evening. I'm actually really excited because that's a very current topic that is important to know more about. So we have Aung here. He is a MPhil student in politics at the University of Hong Kong, and he is from Myanmar or Burma. Or well, I'm going to ask him about this in a second. And we have Isan here. She is also um, a research assistant at the University of Hong Kong, and, and we are doing some other stuff part time as well. Both are from Myanmar, and both will help us understand more about what's going on right now. But I want to say two pieces of um, yeah, expectations to the audience here. First is that. Those of you who know us in ICE, you know that we like to make cultures fun and interesting and sometimes we're a little silly and lighthearted. But this is a topic that is serious to a lot of people as well. So today we'll be a little bit more, you know, less like, ha ha, let's have fun and a little bit more like, yeah, stuff is happening and we're not gonna take any concrete political sides, at least I am not, but we're trying to understand a bit more about this topic from people who actually have a background and from people who come from the country that is currently being affected. So, uh, I, but the second expectation is that I'd also like you to participate in this. It's not just me asking questions or guests giving like explanations or pictures and backgrounds, but it's really going to be a two-way thing. So please, please, please just type in the comments if you see this, if you're lucky to watch this live, this is your chance to really learn more by actually asking a question that can be answered in real time, okay? So I hope you can do this favor for us and yeah, that's it. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. And the first question, as I already uh, asked before, <laughs> Myanmar, Burma, I've even heard Myanmar in English. I know this yeah. is all English, yeah. but okay. First of all, how do you say it in your language, in Burmese, I suppose, but then also yeah. what just what do you prefer people call it? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the two terms uh, where you uh, usually uh, uh, come from the Burmese language terms uh, Myanmar, uh, Burma. So in English we call Burma and Myanmar. So um, these two they don't have um, any differences. So because uh, Myanmar is usually used in colloquial um, languages in the past, and Burma is uh, used in written form. Um, so yeah, uh, that's. Um, but after 1988 uh, uh, uprising, the Wanka desire to switch uh, the term from Burma to Myanmar and they argued uh, Burma, Myanmar, Myanmar is more inclusive uh, and uh, because the country have other ethnic minorities as well uh, but this is not really the case um, both, both, both terms usually refer to the ethnic majority and we don't have uh, inclusive term to um, a more inclusive term yeah so like uh, people who are like who are in from like older generation, they like to stay call it Burma. Like for me, I uh, grew up uh, in the during the military regime, and like uh, at school we are taught to call it Myanmar. So for me, it's more like Myanmar. But the people, one people don't really know like what is where is Myanmar, and then I would be like Burma, and they would be like oh Burma, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, that's how it goes. Uh, for it. us and yeah. for me there's no sort of I don't really have any preference um, okay. that when I talk about my ethnicity then I, I say I'm Burmese, uh, Karen, uh, mm. from Myanmar. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Like <laughs> yeah. We were going to learn later that yes there are a lot of ethnicities inside. Some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller and actually they come from different ethnicities as well. So if you have more questions about the individual ethnic groups, feel free to also write it in the comments. But yeah, so I guess I can call you Burmese for now, right? Yeah. yeah. Totally fine. <laughs> Great. So our lovely Burmese guests here, we're going to dive more into the details or the backgrounds of actually what's happening. So instead of just saying right now, oh yeah, you know, this is people are protesting against the government and that's it, we want to really look, where does it come from? Like what's actually going on? A lot of us didn't learn at school what the history actually was even going back to colonial times, right? Like British Burma, in fact, British India. It was even part of India at some point. So let's unpack that, see actually what happened from the past to the present to help us understand and make sense of what's going on. So with this, maybe 
Aung can try to guide us through what happened in Myanmar or Burma. Yeah, sure. Um, so in the first part of the presentation, I will um, take you through uh, the usually the context of what's going on in Burma at the moment. Um, so before beginning my presentation, I'm going to show you a short clip and uh, and then I'll move on with my presentation. Um, so this is a short clip uh, taken on first February. I think some of you may have uh, already seen it on social on your social media. Uh, yeah, so let's play this viral video. <laughs> Yes, I think people are not sure whether to look at the dance or look at the background, right? It's both is very distracting. Yeah. Alright, so this is uh, her name is uh, Kenyan Wei, and she is a PE teacher and she is also a part time uh, dancer. And she was recording her dance move on, on in the morning of 1st February 2021. And what she did not know was she was also capturing the military coup in the background. So if you see the background, there they are military vehicles approaching the parliament. And um, shortly after, they arrested the elected officials, uh, including the head of the government, um, the presidents, the vice presidents, and um, other top leaders of the ruling party, NLD. Um, so yeah, uh, so this is uh, coup d'etat in Myanmar, and let me uh, take you like briefly to the past. Um, it started in November with the general election. Um, so we had a general election on November 8th, and nationally for democracy, uh, the party of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, the, the famous uh, Nobel laureate, uh, had a landslide victory. Uh, so after her landslide victory, the, the party that is backed by the military called Union Solidarity and Development Party started to make, uh, make accusations of voter fraud in November and December. So these uh, voter frauds were like ongoing and uh, the electoral body uh, rejected their claims, but they, they, they kept pushing uh, their narrative. And in, in January, and in late December, the military started to intervene and uh, they were requesting voter lists from the electoral body and they finally made accusations that there are possibility of voter fraud. Sorry, and, Anne, can I, can I, can I yeah, interrupt sure. you there? That, yeah. Is that just me or is that a weird, is that not the only November 2020 election with voter fraud allegations? <laughs> There's a weird yeah. parallel going on. Yeah. A, yeah. I heard that some people think maybe one was imitating the other in terms of like, hey, seems like quite effective to call out voter fraud. Maybe that's a 2020 thing to do. Yeah. Is there any chance you think they were inspired by the US voter fraud allegations? As a coincidence? Uh, I'm not sure, but I think in many ways uh, they are like many parallels uh, mm -hmm. but because uh, they had both in, in both the US and Myanmar uh, we had election in the same week yeah. and same then week. followed by oh the oh, vote of front allegations week. from the losing side yeah. Yeah. and then yeah like uh, well lucky for the US they, they are who didn't materialize mm -hmm. uh, but yeah this this one uh, this is a military that has been very familiar with the coup. Yeah. 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 So like they're not amateurs like the white uh, nationalists. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Right. But then you see yeah. like uh, those QNL guys um, make a comment like they want a coup like Myanmar in the US oh. or something like that. That's just horrible. Yeah. And yeah, you don't want you don't want a coup in your country. You don't want a coup in any country. Yeah. All right. All right. Okay. Let's continue. Yeah. So yeah, in uh, uh, in January. They, they, they uh, usually in late uh, in late January, uh, the military started to try to negotiate with the ruling party, but the negotiations failed because while well, initially the military um, gave them ultimatum to just uh, suspend the parliament and look into the voter list, and the ruling party wasn't going to give in to their demands. So as a result, uh, the negotiation the negotiations broke down, and finally, um, on first February, the um, 
the, the government leaders, uh, including Aung San Suu Kyi, the president, they were detained by the military, and then there are other um, CSO leaders or activists, like prominent activists, uh, they were all arrested, rounded in their homes, and then we finally heard about uh, the, the coup, and it was confirmed by the national television, the state media, in, in the uh, morning news. Mm, wow, so wake up call in the morning then was, yeah, yep, it was I a coup. I still remember that morning. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a terrible morning, because... Wow. Uh, we were both in Hong Kong at that time. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I knew something was going to happen before that because there were lots of tensions. We saw tanks on the street. The military was displaying yeah. their might, like military might. And well, they finally did that. Yeah. yeah. I remember I was in quarantine for like three weeks. Oh, no. And that, the day, um, the night before that, I just got out of quarantine. And I was so looking forward to like February 1st because there's my freedom, day of freedom, and then um, the coup happened, I woke up to the coup, and yeah, things have, have been the same. Yeah, yeah, uh, okay, let's have a look at uh, the past and yeah. see whether we can construct what's happening. We're gonna, yeah. we're gonna come back to the present soon, yeah. okay, don't worry about it, yeah. Yeah. let's have a look. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, the coup or the military rule isn't very strange, um, like unusual uh, for the country because there have been quite a lot of coups in the past. And uh, so the first coup was uh, started in 1958. Before that, um, we gained independence in 1948. And then uh, there's a brief period of parliamentary democracy between 1940s and 1960. Yeah. So at the time, the, I mean, the country wasn't stable uh, because there were uh, in fighting between the government troops and the and forces from the ethnic minorities, and then there were communist insurgents, mm -hmm. and then there were um, Kuomintang. Uh, for those with uh, family with the Chinese yeah. history, will know what Kuomintang yeah. were. And Basically, the Chinese civil war was raging, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. It's bordering China, so yeah. the Chinese nationalists were retreating. Yeah. Into so them. they were defeated in the Chinese civil war. So the nationalists uh, have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So they decided they, they had to uh, cross the border and station in the eastern part of the country. The, 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 the nationalist troops were quite a challenge for the government because, well, they, they started their own country. So they don't have a lot of uh, military power. Um, yeah, so that, that quite passes. And that the civil war is also the reason uh, the military became stronger than any other civilian institutions because the country has been at war so a lot of resources were put into the military mm -hmm. and uh, in 1958 uh, the military staged a coup, uh, the first coup and um, it was uh, because of the infighting between the civilian uh, leaders there were lots of factions among the politicians so the military wasn't happy with the politicians, uh, the bear, their internal divisions. Mm. Uh, yeah, and uh, they decided to come in, uh, clean up the mess uh, made by the politicians, and then they went out two years later. Uh, but I think in, in many ways that the first coup gave them the impression that the military is actually, the military can do a better job than the civilians. Mm. Uh, because the civilians are incompetent, they, they, they tend to just, um, uh, they are just motivated by their own interests. Um, so they, they received that kind of impression and uh, they staged another coup in 1962. This time, they have a longer plan. They, want, they just want to stay in power. But by they, is it the same kind of people? Is it like the sons and sons of those original generals or is it is it actually different? Like. Does military always mean the same group, or is there? It, it is the same group led by General Nguyen. Oh, yeah. He is also um, he also he is also one of the leaders in the independence. Mm -hmm. So he had quite a lot of respect back then. Popular support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, there were some opposition from student unions, because student unions are always very pro democracy mm -hmm. and all that. So yeah, uh, but. Uh, other sections of the population don't really challenge the military coup in 1960s. I think that is a major mistake for everyone. 
because uh, if people show enough support back in those days, then the military will not do that. Like right. back then, well, people were like really tired of the politicians. You know, they are um, senseless fighting with each other, like lots of personal rivalries. So people finally kind of accepted the military rule, and uh, they the general Nguyen had a vision of what he wants the country to be look like and that is called Bami's way to socialism. Uh, so he reasoned um, the like if you look at into into the east or the south the, uh, sorry the northern part of the country you have China communist he doesn't like that and if you look to the west uh, you have American led uh, western group mm -hmm. capitalism he he reasoned that is not good as well so like it, it is ultimately his middle way, uh, yeah, but uh, that kind of ruined the country, um, like lots of uh, his uh, control economy and all that. Um, so as a result, in 1988, the students uh, started a protest, and then that protest grew into a much bigger popular opposition against the military. And after that, uh, so that that is uh, the time when Aung San Suu Kyi came into into the scene, into the mm. political scene, and she was uh, just taking care of her ill mother, and she didn't have any plans to be a politician. Uh, it, maybe you have to mention who her father was. I'm not sure everyone yeah, yeah, knows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Her father is an uh, independent leader, Aung San, and uh, so uh, people admire him for many reasons. And he was assassinated before the country uh, re received in the independence. So many people see her as well legacy of her father, and many people uh, ask her to lead them because back then the the protest movement was leaderless. Mm -hmm. uh, so she finally accepted uh, her position as a leader, and uh, but the military. Uh, they, they won the election in 1990 at the, and she formed a party uh, called National League for Democracy, uh, NLD. And, but uh, the election results were not honored by the military and she and uh, other leaders were put under house arrest or some of them were even jailed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that was actually, so that just what happened on the 1st of February or even in November 2020 isn't actually the first time they won and military first kind of like yeah okay elections and then actually we don't like the results so much so that actually yeah. happened in 1990 already yeah with the yeah. same person yeah. the same party um yeah the same military <laughs> the same because military. The, the generals have changed but they still keep uh yeah. the same habit yeah. yeah and the same winner party and all the again <laughs> like mm -hmm. being arrested being put on house arrest and yeah that we're seeing history repeating itself basically yeah <sighs> Yeah, and then so from 1990 onwards, so elections, but then not recognized, and then house arrest, and then the military took control, and then from the 90s until basically what like the 2010s, like 2015, 16 was yeah. kind of a consistent time. Or how would you describe that time? Um, during that time, it was the military rule until uh, 2008. Um, sorry, 2013. Uh, yeah, 2010. If you uh, are conservative, uh, so yeah. Um, between between the period, it was complete, uh, completely under the military rule. Uh, everything is censored. Uh, you cannot criticize the military or the generals openly in the public because you are always in fear of the secret police uh, knocking on you know, onto your door and trying to press you. Right. Yeah. And that was kind of the time where you were basically growing up, right? Like your childhood years, yeah. in some sense. Yeah. Yes, we don't have any access to alternative news. So all the only news you hear are from state media, and all the all they talk about is how great the generals are. And I did like I don't know about you, but like I did really grew up believing like that they are actually great. Yeah. And you know, um, mm. but yeah. Interesting. Wow. But then, but then Aung San Suu Kyi was still being everyone still knew about her. Or because she was put under house arrest and you grew up with like military telling you the generals are great, but I, I still feel like so many people respect her. So even maybe in the 90s, people still know her, believe in her, understand that she's under house arrest. 
I, I think so because um, um, people, even though they cannot publicly uh, support her, uh, they were like, you know, there were like photos of Aung San Suu Kyi um, or um, the tape video take videos of uh, her speech etc etc mm -hmm. and uh, the state media controlled by the military actually defamed her uh, because her husband is a foreigner and uh, she spent her entire life abroad uh, she was in the UK before that she was in India uh, mm -hmm. studying so yeah it is it is kind of an easy target uh, to defame her for the generals mm -hmm. However, I think it's also because her father is Aung San, so like military they see her father as their hero, right. well, because he's the founder of the army, right? This is so they the couldn't just like jail her or anything, right? Yeah. 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 So like in our history textbook, we still talk about Aung San and we say praise about Aung San and like everyone loves uh, loves him, him, and so because she is connected to him as well. That is also part of the reason why people are also drawn to her. Yeah. Although no matter how like the army yeah. tried to defame her. I think that is also because of because the general Nguyen back then he was the 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 leader of the military. Uh, because he believed if he promote uh Aung San, he will also people will also accept him yeah. as a proxy because sure. He is also a friend of Aung San, and he also fights, fought uh, the British yeah. together with Aung San. Mm, um, like so yeah, symbol for like independence and against the British. And yeah, I think a lot of countries have these issues, right? When they build up a certain uh, figure as a, a little bit of a cult of personality to justify their own rule or existence, and it's like a double-edged sword because then you, <laughs> once you tell everyone to respect that person who is not you, then you're can't really get rid of that image easily. Right? Yeah, right. Uh, right. Okay, cool, let's continue. Yep. So, um, under the military, we have, um, so we, we developed our nationalism, and that is all that is going to be quite important uh, for, for this movement and also uh, the Rohingya genocide as well. Um, so, under the military, I think uh, if, we, if we go back to 1988, the military realized uh, there were cooperation between the NLD, the party of Aung San Suu Kyi, and the ethnic minorities. And they don't like that because um, they, they thought they're going to be a force and they, they, could, like, they have potential to defeat the military. Mm -hmm. So as a result, they decided to crack down on the ethnic minorities. And um, so we call it uh, bombardization. So they desire to ban the ethnic languages, uh, teaching of ethnic languages in schools. Um, so they are, they were not even allowed to publish anything in their own languages. Uh, so everything has to be in Burmese, uh, the language spoken and written by the ethnic majority. Um, so um, you can put it under a racial like pyramid. So at the top here, you have the ethnic majority, Burma. And then at the bottom, you have recognized ethnic groups who are still recognized by the states, but um, they're like not as important as the Burma. And then uh, at the bottom, you've got um, other nameless races, mainly Chinese and Indians. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, that is a bit tough because when when we, I grew up in the West, right, and I hear about it always, like yeah, um, ethnic issues and you know um, civil wars and they're trying to eradicate ethnicities we just learn it as a simple thing okay there is an ethnicity and people want to eradicate the ethnicity but we never really understand why like what, what what's even the point aren't you just making yourself enemies like why don't you just say oh we respect all the ethnicities and therefore consolidate control and power i never really understood this but it seems like it had to do also with the nld potentially combining uh, like making yeah. friends with all the ethnicities right? yeah mm -hmm. yeah so it's all politics yeah. So at right. the end of the day, it is really the the paranoia of the generals. Mm -hmm. uh, they're quite paranoid about uh, these things, mm -hmm. and they they kind of live live in their own reality. Mm -hmm. So it is um, really hard to understand their viewpoints. Yeah, they're very isolated. No one really know how like the rules inside this uh, institution basically, and it's really. Um, hard to like know what they're thinking yeah yeah 
All right, all right, let's continue. And uh, we've got uh, democratic transition in the 2010s, uh, in, a, in a short decade. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the generals wrote their own constitution. And this, what is so strange about this constitution is that they give 25% uh, of the parliament to the military representatives who, so they, they, they don't have to go through elections like everyone else. And uh, they control three key ministries, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which control the police, and Ministry of Immigration. Oh. Uh, so yeah. you, you can see yeah. uh, what's, <laughs> um, like how important these uh, mm -hmm. ministries are. And they also control uh, one vice president is also appointed by the military. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they, and not just that, they also uh, have quite a huge power in judish, uh, judiciary and um, administration as well. Um, so, so everyone thought, well, like they have such a huge control in almost every sector of the government. Um, so that is probably their retirement plan for the generals. Uh, and well, uh, the the generals, uh, the the leader of the military, Tan Shui, uh, he did retire after that, and he gave the power to the um, to to his uh, juniors. But that doesn't uh, well, the coup showed that they didn't think that was a bad, that was a good plan, huh. and they decided to take the power back. Why do you think they even did it? Why do you think they liberalized and tried at least democratized, right? From a hundred percent to twenty five percent, it's still a a democratization to some degree. Do, it was it. Do you think they had so much pressure from outside, or do you think there were actually just some reformists in the military who thought it's gonna be better for the country? I think they 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 always have a plan, but they were just so slow yeah. at um, implementing right. yeah. their plans. Uh, one of the reason is that uh, they don't want to be too rely reliant on China mm -hmm. because China is the only country um, they have to look up to if anything happens. Mm. So they want to diversify yeah, uh, right. their foreign relations. Mm. Uh, that is one plan. And they want to have better relationship with the with the West. Mm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, we also need to talk about Buddhist nationalism uh, when it comes to um, Burma, because that is quite important. Um, um, and most of the listeners will probably know Rohingya genocide that happened continuously from 2012 to 2017. I mean, it's still you can you can argue it's still ongoing, and that that, that it will took us back to 1978 where the general Ne Win, uh, the first military dictator, uh, started um, the parch, like the, he started to parch the Rohingya from the Burmese society. And uh, there were brutal military campaigns against uh, the Rohingya villages, and that, that, that uh, and they also uh, desired to not give any ID cards to Rohingya, so that kind of rendered them stateless because they well they, they are not recognized by the state, and uh, well they, there's also other systematic oppression uh, discrimination against uh, this uh, Muslim minority group. And uh, that culminated in 2012 uh, in communal tension between Rohingya and uh, Buddhist, uh, their Buddhist neighbors, Rakhine. And then uh, in 2016, the military decided to uh, run uh, clearance operations against the Rohingya. And as a result, over 700,000 Rohingyas were, uh, have to, had to flee wow. to the neighboring country, Bangladesh. So it started with like politics and ethnic groups, but it kind of now it spills over religion as well. Right? Now it feels like Buddhism and Islam play. Yeah, 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 yeah. That um, that actually play a huge important role uh, in uh, in the democratic uh, transition, um, mainly after 2012, uh, the the communal tensions between Rohingya and Rakhine. There were lots of Buddhist nationalists. Uh, showing their support for the military and at the same time showing their rejection of Rohingya from yeah. the society. That is still something I find so strange in my brain. Again, from the West growing up, Buddhism is always associated with peace and praying and, and, then, and then like Buddhist nationalism and Buddhist and military just doesn't compute in my brain, but I guess that is a bit more normal in Myanmar. Yeah, yeah. Um, usually Theravada Buddhism, um, the, the, the sect um, practiced in Burma, 
is uh, quite interlinked with politics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is uh, back in those days. Yeah. The, it is not strange for the kings to um, subscribe to the one set of uh, Buddhist group, uh, and, and he will support the Buddhist group and the the, the sangha, mm -hmm. uh, the association of monks. Uh, the Sangha will in turn give legitimacy to the king. Mm, wow, yeah. So that's a kind of a different type of Buddhism than what you think of in China, Tibet, like, you know, that kind of Buddhism. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, let's continue. Let's so, yeah, yeah uh, this have... is the quote of uh, a prominent monk. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you can read it for yourself. So, we are, he essentially legitimized violence against the Muslim group, the Rohingya. And this summon, he made this summon uh, when he was meeting with uh, a group of generals. So that kind of carried a lot of weight. So he was essentially uh, telling the generals, well, if they're not Buddhists, I mean, it, it is not sinful to kill them. So yeah, that oh, that, wow. that is... Yeah. A monk, yeah, that is, <laughs> wow. And he's, like, he's considered to be the... the, the, the the leader of the Sangha in Myanmar and most powerful Ooh. in the country and you would see him always like um, always with those uh, military generals and yeah and it just doesn't really you know go well with like Buddha's teaching yeah. and when I think about it myself I'm just like I'm not a real Buddhist I mean like like a proper buddhas but then at least i know what buddha teachings are and you you are a monk and you're preaching uh hate and yeah. yeah that is yeah. wow so when, when religion and politics mixes this can happen okay cool. let's continue yeah. so yeah um, these are the photos of buddhist monks uh showing um so their support for the military and then um showing their hatred against uh, the rohingya um, yeah, basically the Rohingya are seen as terrorists, uh, intruders into the country, foreigners. Yeah. So uh, this photo is kind of iconic because this billboard um, was uh, set up, uh, put up on uh, in 2019 when Aung San Suu Kyi went to the Hague to face uh, genocide accusations. Uh, uh, and uh, she she denied uh, the genocide accusations at the ICJ, and she but and at and in a in a similar time she talked about the generals and well the way she referred to the generals uh the, the generals in my cabinet are rather sweet uh, so that look at how that turns out for her because <laughs> she is now in the captivity yeah. of the military. I wonder what she's thinking right now. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. That so, brings us back to the protests. Yeah. And, um, before we continue, I, I want to ask you again, if you're in the audience, you're watching this live, feel free to type something in the comments. Anything you wish, I will, will, can answer your life. And this is a chance to really to understand an opinion from someone from Myanmar instead of just going to Wikipedia and see what people write there. Um, so please, please, please write something in the comments if you are curious. And, okay, let's continue. Thank you. Well, now that we've gone back to the past and look into the historical context and how why are we here like why did we land it here um, now we're going to look into present and um, well as uh, Aun has already mentioned about what happened on the, in the morning right for the first week of the coup for the first week there were a lot of confusion and people are still like not going out on the street but then just sharing like news and information on facebook and just sort of like um what sharing information basically and everyone is waiting for sort of like waiting for a signal waiting for someone to lead uh for a movement but then for a whole week there was a lot of confusion and then on uh, after the on the weekend of the first week, that was when we see people going out on the street because the military kind of um, um, mobilized there and like for a whole day you couldn't reach to your family, you couldn't call, and you couldn't get on internet. Um, so like people started to go out uh, on the seventh day of on the sixth day of the of the coup and. That is when we see, like, 
you know, um, the school uniting everyone and everyone's out on the street. It was not, not just uh, NLB supporters uh, who are out on the street. It was also like activists, human rights activists who are who just don't like the military. There are a lot. And ethnic minorities as well, you will see like in the during the democratic transitions there were a lot of tension between uh NLD government, uh, especially in like Chin State, even uh, Gachin and Karan State, there were a lot of uh tensions uh because uh still NLD government was also had a lot of shortcomings when it comes to um ethnic um uh, unity. Mm -hmm. And so we see now with the coup bring all of these groups together and everyone out on the street. And on the second picture, that is my hometown and that oh. was on the Koran National Day. Oh. Uh, so everyone was out on the street and supporting uh, uh for NLD and also like uh like calling for democracy. Are, are they wearing some particular costume? Because the colors yes. seem very similar, like all yes. bluish, reddish. So they they are wearing my uh, ethnic uh, um, uh, yeah clothes clothing. So it's very colorful. You have like blue, red, like yeah, all like <laughs> all different color, but not a dull color, gray, no gray mm -hmm. or black. Okay. But the rest. So, <laughs> the it, so does what you wear have high symbolism in Myanmar in terms of ethnic groups? Yes. Like uh, every different, uh, every ethnic group have their own, um, their own dress and yeah. clothing, and they are very different actually. Yes. Okay. So, like reaction from the public, used uh, after the coup, there were a lot of movements coming out from from the public as a you know. Uh, Sort of like um, against the coup, and we see like the biggest movement in the country is currently is like civil disobedience movement. That is when uh, all the civil servants from the country from different sectors. It's, it was started by um, by health workers uh, from refusing to work for the the military regime, and then calling for other sectors to join uh, this labor strike, and then. Uh, Military boycott campaign, so a lot of like uh, online campaign to because the military is uh, it depends on their like it's sort of like capitalist because so they like do, own businesses, they, they, they have their have, own business yeah, empire, yeah, mm. and it is really huge. And they their business range from extracting natural resources to making a safety pin and like you know to like different range, and basically they have their own them and their cronies on those business mm -hmm. and yeah you can't really escape military brands in the country military actually. Brands. So, so it started yeah. from Burmese style socialism to yeah. military <laughs> capitalism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. And they're so rich but then they they stay are hungry for power mm -hmm. and it wasn't enough for them and they had right. to have a complete control. So it's economic boycott and also yeah, like also civil disobedience. Civil disobedience mm -hmm. movement. And then we also see well Pop banging movement that was started uh, at the earlier. I don't. I'm not sure if people are still doing that. And we also have public uh, protests, like people going out on the street, uh, starting from the first after the first week of the coup, and then um, red ribbon campaign that was at the start of like the people wearing red ribbons or the civil servants, uh, even if the, you don't participate in CDM, you wear a red ribbon to mm -hmm. sort of like show your support for democracy and social media campaigns. Yeah. Wow, okay, we actually got a question already no. uh, from Patricia from London as it seems um, about do people of Myanmar feel nostalgia, good or bad, or towards the British leaving? I think we are happy that British, British are not in our country anymore. <laughs> I think we it's something for us British uh, history because I guess it's because during the past de decades, there a lot had happened, and we had had uh, military regimes so, uh, after the British left, right? So there are a lot of a lot in our mind to actually think about. Oh, what was what was life like in the British era? And, and yeah. yeah, some of the issues are in many ways legacies of British colonialism. Um, well, for instance, uh, in 
Burma was a part of British India, mm. uh, and as a result, uh, there was unlimited um, uh, immigration from India to mm. Burma, mm. Uh, and the British imported a lot of Indian labor, mm. uh, so they wanted to use it mainly in urban areas or in agricultural sector, because mm. there were lots of free lands and no no farmers to till the land. Uh, well, um, well, the the issue is here is that because the, there, there was uh, a large group of people in such a short amount of time, mm -hmm. uh, it created conflicts uh, with the locals. Mm -hmm. and, and that, that animosity still continues, the hostility towards the Indians uh, still continues. Mm -hmm. And that also translated into the anti-Muslim mm -hmm. uh, yeah. rhetorics. Um, yeah. Got it. So in some sense, British importing labor mm -hmm. can be like, can can actually result to some of those ethnic conflicts you can yeah. see. Right? Yeah. And also, like during the British era, we uh, they had this like divide and rule policy with how they rule Burma, mm -hmm. um, Myanmar, and where they were really they are more friendly toward um, ethnic minority like uh, Karens were big. Uh, that's their your, biggest your friend. minority. Yeah, yeah a biggest friend Kachin, and they were close friends with like the. Uh, ethnic people on the frontiers area, but then they are harsher on Burma group, like mm -hmm. the majority, and Burma have a stronger or like more bitter feelings about British than mm -hmm. ethnic groups. So that also created after independent, um, uh, when Bo Johnson got assassinated and like when the promises of the panel wasn't, uh, you know, kept, then ethnic people when we're like, why would we sort of uh, join hand with the Bamas and uh -huh, you know, uh -huh. uh, yeah, so it's also created the whole like civil wars is also a legacy of yeah. the British, but it's okay guys, it's fine, <laughs> we <We'll> stop it, <laughs> so we're yeah. not blaming you. All right, <laughs> right, right. And I guess you're a little bit too young for nostalgia directly, right? So it's, yeah. it's been a while since the it's British It's been a while, left. yeah, and a lot had happened. Yeah. Uh, Got it. that we need to move forward. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Patricia, <laughs> though, uh, for this question. And uh, anyone else, Good feel question. free to answer, uh, ask any question we can interrupt and we can answer. But okay, let's continue uh, uh, what's going on with the protests. So you see all the ladies, everyone's pop banging, and yeah. Um, yeah. I think we can yeah. get to this one. <laughs> so, like, uh, aside from the uh, all the movement, CDM, and all the uh, social media campaign, we are also seeing like a, a parallel government being formed and being active uh, by uh, from the NLD government. So like after the uh, after the election, so the coup happened on the day that the new government should should assume the power and sort of like start the assembly, but then. The coup, the military just took over and it didn't happen. So this com committee representing Firang Duloto was founded by the elected parliament member, uh, mainly mostly like NLD uh, officials, and is a like parallel government to the regime's state uh, security council. After the coup, the military sort of founded their own um, state. Security Council, their cabinet, and then, but this uh, CRPH is actually growing, uh, gaining a lot of support, not just from the people, but also from like uh, international community as well. And they are actively, um, we're seeing them actively corresponding with the UN officials and like and with the ethnic uh, arms group as well. So it's we are now seeing you know, to governments in our country. So that's very interesting and, uh, well, we hope the so, government win. <laughs> but yeah. but so is, it, is it also like depending on where you are, like how far away you are from the capital in terms of which government actually like on the ground? Uh, is, not yet, right? because oh. the military government uh, is powerful, but it is, so they are everywhere. it doesn't have legitimacy, mm -hmm. so almost everyone is opposed to it. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, the CRPH, um, it does have legitimacy because it is composed of the elected yeah, right. members of parliament. But 
it has no power. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't yeah. have resources or yeah. like the armed group behind them to do whatever they want. Yeah. Um, so yeah, mainly they are meeting officials via Zoom and le releasing statements, and uh, that is what they are doing. Thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and yes, this, these are the pictures from earlier stage of the protest where it has been really peaceful and a lot of like creative like protests you would see, and it was kind of like heartwarming at start, and then. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, starting from the end of uh, last month and like earlier this um, this month uh, we, we are seeing the situation getting worse um, we see harsher crackdown on the protests and uh, like live ammunitions are being used to crack down uh, peaceful protesters and a lot of people are now arming themselves with like makeshift uh, sort of uh, shields. They don't even have any uh, weapons, it's just shields. People are just out. Most of them are, uh, they call it Gen Z, uh, younger than us like uh, youth, um, going out on the streets and protesting and just uh, like now, like uh, according to the UN, like we, there are like more than 200 deaths from the start of the coup and uh, from like protest um, crackdown. But then the number could be higher because yeah. there are a lot of uh, arrests as well. Like uh, without any errands, uh, the, the people are just being rounded up from their houses at night, and and yeah, they're just being taken sometimes like people don't even know where they're being taken to and a lot of the time those detainees come back as body, just a dead body and yeah. it is really getting worse and worse and now I like sometimes it's just like I'm really scared of going to social media and seeing yeah. uh, you know all the news because it just gets really really distressing yes. and, um, and then just this weekend uh, the martial law was imposed in like six townships in Yangon and and we are seeing well that means like executions are okay you know in those area and the every residents have to adhere to the martial law and the military has control over their life and the, the, those area has been sealed off and from the public and now with internet shutdown as well it's really harder and harder to get information on what is going on on the ground. Yeah, I see. So that's, uh, that is quite tough. So does it actually ring a bell to you compared to, let's say, 1990? Or is it actually, do you feel it's worse now? Or do you think it's, it's just not comparable? I, well, I think I have, it feels worse because we are living through yeah, it, true, right? True, true, we are li yeah. living through it. Like when we when we talk about uh, 1990s and like 88 uh, protests, yeah, those are the images you see is heartbreaking. But then it's now like I have friends who are living in Yangon and yeah. who I have family back home and you are like, it feels worse now because of that. But then I don't really have a, a lot of historical background to sort of like give which is worse. It's been over 30 years, uh, but it shows that the military as an institution hasn't been reformed yet. Mm -hmm. um, well, because uh, well, back in those days, there were, you know, well, we've got Tianmen in China, and we've got other similar events in other countries. But mostly in, in this modern period, um, you don't usually shoot peaceful protesters just because you don't agree with them. Uh, you've got other methods to crack down, even if you want to crack yeah. down. Uh, well, even if we look at our neighboring country, Thailand, uh, they also have military yeah. regime, but uh, well, they just arrested the protesters and give them uh, jail sentence. Yeah. That, is, uh, that is not fair, but still it is a lot better than being killed yes. on the streets. Yeah. Yes, that is. And I also, every morning I hear news, I hear a new update again and more people killed. It is quite yeah. serious. Okay, uh, we, I think we have to uh, continue. Yeah. We also have a question or a comment from mm -hmm. Georg or George Bauer. Georg I'm not Bauer. sure. Probably Georg. <laughs> uh, talking about uh, some, some deeper issue about uh, 
racism or Burmanization. Um, so it's not just about politics, it's actually an ideology that's developed over time, is his comment. Um, is there any comment from your side? I guess you know him. I know him, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, yeah. Yeah, yeah um, anything you want to add or just like, yes, uh, read his comment? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it is definitely in their ideology as the military as well. Well, as, as an inst institution that relies on arms and physical power, um, the military is, has always been quite nationalist, mm -hmm. and, um, and and they also it is also driven by their experience in the civil war. Yeah. They see the ethnic minorities as untrustworthy uh, because they've been fighting a lot of wars with uh, Christian ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it is ingrained in their institutional mindset that. Um, only Burma Buddhists are trustworthy mm -hmm. to the military, right. so they are they turn, they rewarded uh, only those people. Um, like so if, so, if you look at um, the people at the top, they usually tend to be Burma, and their religion is Buddhist. Yeah. But I, I guess my commentary would also be that you can't completely separate uh, politics, uh, ethnic ideology, and even religion in that case, where they all interact. And if it goes over generations. Mm -hmm. Maybe it can start as a political game and then turn into genuine feelings of your identity when you grow up and, and, and religion gets involved. And, yeah. yeah. But okay, let's continue. Thank you for the comment. <laughs> Thank you, Georg. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, like now we're going to move into the reaction from the around the world. So, like for well, our neighbors, the ASEAN and China, for them, they, they are in a quite a tricky sort of um, position because they have much closer to us so they have to be a lot more diplomatic I think in their in their comments I mean in ASEAN like for them to give a strong condemnation to the coup I mean if you look at Thailand it's also a, a military government so yeah we are not seeing a lot of um, you know strong condemnations or like actions from the ASEAN or China and uh, most of the time they, they see this as a internal affairs that everyone should resolve to it peacefully and like <clears throat> negotiations that is what they will hope the like you know push in for but then we are also seeing like with uh, China we are also seeing a lot of anti uh, anti Chinese or China uh, sentiment in the country and that can be very dangerous and mm -hmm. that is uh, that could really push China to to an edge where they would be like, okay, we won't support you guys anymore. Because well, I heard you were like because, burning down Chinese businesses and stuff. Yeah, like. so there were some uh, Chinese factories were uh, attacked and uh, some Chinese nationals were uh, were harmed in the in the process. And this really, China has released a statement condemning that uh, violent act by the protesters and mm -hmm. I think that is something that we should be much more careful with because we don't yeah we don't want China to be on the opposite side of us. So, so what, do you think the average Burmese citizen would see China as closer to the military or closer to NLD? Closer to the military and there's a lot of rumors accusations just from the start like start of the coup going where like <clears> there are pictures images of like saying that oh like the Chinese government is sending uh, arms to the military government or like they are uh, sending their soldiers mm -hmm. to but all of them has been uh, debunked and they are not true and there's no interest for China to uh, be you know sending their yeah. troops into Myanmar they're not gaining yeah, anything yeah, from yeah. that and they don't want the sort of a conflict in, yeah. in, the, in their backyard yeah, so absolutely. I don't think like yeah, this is not in their best interest. Yeah, it's um, just popular anger turned yes, to us. But yeah. yeah, but then there's a lot of emotion in play as yes. well. People feel like they need to find someone to blame. And, Absolutely. And they yeah. want a the strong time. stand from yeah. China uh, to support the people. Yeah. So and for Western countries, yes, you see a lot more like a stronger language, like of uh, condemnations, and also like. Uh, Targets attention towards the military personnel and like military businesses, but then also that again, like a lot of people are calling for the U.S. or like the U.N. to send troops or whatever. But then 
it is just not possible because mm. there's just no incentive for them to send their troops into Myanmar and get involved in this messy business. Oh. And but then uh, mm. just yesterday, I think just yesterday, the UN had opened the independent uh, investigation mechanism for Myanmar, mm. so people can send like sort of a video proofs and evidence of like um, human rights abuse from the military and the troops. So the people are feeling this is a hope, like this is feeling feeling hopeful that this would bring justice to mm. uh, to them, and that hopefully one day the you know soon uh, the military generals will stand trial or like will be tried for their abuses and their crimes. So yeah. Okay, let's continue. We also have a question from Shana. Um, but we'll get to that later. Let's finish our slides first, and then we'll see if anyone has any questions that we can address. So yeah, that's well. At the end, we're just gonna close off with some possible outcomes. But like, I mean, we are not a fortune teller <laughs> or like a political um, uh, analyst, so we don't really know what is gonna happen. But then, like, these are just sort of like the possible outcomes. So if people win, like, how we can win, like, CDM and the protest, like the military at the end feeling like, okay, actually, maybe we're just pushing ourselves to the um, to the edge and to a cliff. Maybe we should sort of like uh, negotiate and give back the power or whatever. Then maybe we might win. Maybe that could be one possibility. And then another hope from the people is that we will be seeing a lot of soldiers and a lot of uh, uh, police and like maybe senior officials from the military defecting and not following orders mm -hmm. uh, of the you know the, the guy yeah, main yeah, online yeah. and maybe that's how we can win. But then if the military win, well, we're gonna be <laughs> hope I guess maybe we're gonna be uh, back to military dictatorship yeah. or some form of democracy. But like the one that <clears throat> military like to use like discipline democracy, meaning military is gonna be along the way, along our mm -hmm. like democ democratic journey, be like, oh, I'm the father, I'm your parents, you know, and <sighs> yeah, that's the yeah. sort of the future, uh, if they win, or like, and more, uh, like, in um, for the civil war be getting more yeah. intensified, you know, so that's, with our sort of like, Maybe prediction. our prediction and uh. not predictions, like possible outcomes. Yeah. yeah. Um. But we never know. We yeah. don't really know what's gonna happen. Uh, yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. I mean, I know we're not fortune tellers, but let's hope mm -hmm. for the best. And I know there's not much we can do here directly, but mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, like I think it's not uh, hard to guess what you're hoping will happen, mm -hmm. but. Uh, yeah, maybe the last question I will ask and then see if we have the time to address any of the other questions. It's just for me, um, if you have, you both live in Hong Kong right now, and I'm sure you have Hong Kong friends, or maybe you have friends from other places in the world, and, and you know what's the current situation. If people just want to get more informed or want to do something and they don't know what, do you have any advice for them? Like, talk to me or go to a certain website or check out, like, learn more. Like, what should people do? There are a few websites uh, where you can support the civil disobedience movement. Um, either like you can donate um, through the website, and um, there are also attempts to memorialize the victims of the military violence. It's called Fallen Heroes of Myanmar or something like that. Um, so yeah, uh, there are a few of those websites where you can learn about. Uh, the victims, uh, because um, they're not just victims of the military, they were once persons mm -hmm. um, who have their lives drained. Uh, so it is important that uh, we remember uh, the victims. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, thank, uh, I want to say thank you so much again for you and for also for the audience. And maybe we can address the last question here from Shana. Sword. I'm not sure that's a real name, but if so, that's a cool name. That's a really cool name. <laughs> How much alteration of history do you think the military has affected, and what would you recommend for accurate information? Yeah, I think that's actually similar to my last question. Right? So, do you think actually the, it's very like official information? Like, you, it's just very skewed. You shouldn't believe it. And uh, first of all, do you think so? Well, I don't have a ruler to like measure <laughs> yeah. the the, uh, um, the alterations. 
But I think um, the military, well, the school curriculum is completely solved the problems of the military. Mm, okay. uh, for, for instance, they don't teach about ethnic minorities in school. Mm. Uh, all they teach is about the ethnic majority, yeah. Burma, like the Asian, uh, Burma Kings, Kings yeah. uh, dynasties. Got it. So that kind of creates, um, th so it doesn't give any space for for the ethnic minorities who also have their own history. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, okay. So education is definitely mm -hmm. self-serving. Yeah. And then yeah. Is, if, if you want to find out more, like, is Wikipedia accurate enough according to you? Or what, what do you feel like? Where should people, especially outsiders, mm -hmm. learn unbiased information? <laughs> well, there are a lot of um, sort of histo his, like, historian books written by like historians. And I, I would suggest you yeah, you, yeah, read some of that. Um, but I, I don't really know, have a book that I can recommend. You can uh, read Dan Yin Wu uh, books. He, he is, is a like a, a Burmese, um, yeah. a Burmese historian, mm -hmm. very famous in Myanmar. And you can also read. Uh, there are also like some autobiographical books by Aung San Suu Kyi. So you can read uh, that as well. And also other sort of like. Um, yeah, his historical like okay. books written by well, one of uh, sort of scholars. I would suggest okay. that. But yeah, I, I think myself. we can put that in yeah. the comments later. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay, lovely. Then, um, yeah, time is up, unfortunately. Uh, flies really, really fast. But I learned a lot in this hour, and I still feel I could talk for another two hours. But uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time. So. Uh, one more time, thanks so much, okay? Thanks, Ang. Thanks, Isan. Thank you I wish for you the, I wish you the best with your research. I wish you the best with your MPhil. <laughs> and then you're going to be a master of politics <laughs> and hopefully a doctor of politics at some point. Do uh, you think you're going to become an academic? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Great, yeah. then. I hope we can intellectually enrich ourselves even more in the future. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank and you. thanks, everyone else. I hope you stay curious. If you're interested, we're going to have another session next week more on the cultural side. So less heavy on politics and more just understanding the people and the cultures and the ethnicities. Uh, next Thursday, same time. And in general, we in ICE, we're not just about Myanmar, of course. We are about just understanding the whole world. So I'm definitely not an expert in any one country, but I'm curious. And I hope you will be curious with me and with us together. So remember to subscribe if you can. Follow us on our social media. And I hope to see you again. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Then you can start this.